So welcome back everyone to another episode of Life, People, and the Pursuit of Art. Thank you for tuning in. If you're tuning in, watching in, uh, however kind of way you're listening to video or audio, I'm rambling. But anyway, let me just cut to the chase. I have with me a very talented actress from California or... I am from California. Oh, yeah. Okay, just making sure. So, so I'm like a goof. Um, Crystal M. Harris, thank you for uh, coming on. Well, thank you for having me. I yes. am a little embarrassed, a little nervous, but I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Um, I'm always nervous when I do this podcast because it's always a different experience for me um, every yeah. time. So, but yeah, definitely thank you for coming on. Um, to those who are out there, me and Crystal have worked on a project. I won't go too much into it because I know we're still kind of in that, uh, that phase where we don't want to reveal too much. But it's called the New Jim Crow Majority Rules. And me and her worked on this project. So kind of give me insight. That's how we know each other. But that's pretty much the extent of how I know Crystal. So I wanted to segue that into Crystal. Uh, tell me a bit more about who you are and what you do. Um, okay, that's, that is a broad question. Well, who I am, um, I'm a beautiful soul here to tell stories. That's kind of what I'm about. So I grew up in Northern California, so you had it right, okay. but I was in LA for the last 14 years. Okay. That. But I grew up in the mountains of Northern California, 18 acres of farmland, and yeah, it, it was, it was a beautiful upbringing, I can say that. And then I just kind of discovered a love of real people, their stories. And my dad, my parents got divorced and I um, wound up traveling to the Philippines a lot because my dad moved there. Oh. And I'm like introduced to a whole new culture, a whole new world. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, the thing about me was I was always watching how similar we were. And okay. that is what, attracted me to the way I tell stories is kind of connecting people through that basic human fabric. Okay. Yeah. Um, tell me, and I'm going to get back to that question and, and uh, excuse me, and an extension, but tell me more about uh, your overall experience in the Philippines. In, in the film industry? No, Phil, the Philippines. The Philippines. Oh, Yes. You know, I actually was looking at my passports just the other day and I was trying to count up how many times I've been there and then all these memories started flooding back. Um, unfortunately, we just experienced a uh, death in the family of one I'm of sorry. Yeah, it's pretty sad, but uh, somebody who was in the Philippines and I was kind of like, what's funny is I've been there for short spurts throughout okay. my, since I was 12 years old. So okay. first it was three months in the summer, every summer, and then that kind of waned, and then I became an adult, and I went as soon as whenever I could go. And so being there just in these short spurts, you, you understand that people are your family, you understand that you've got this extended um, group of people who you care about in a whole other country, but it, you don't spend as much time as you do with the people you grow up with, right? So. Mm -hmm. When we experienced that death, I was just like, it affected, I had to leave work that day. It was too much. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty sad. And, and then I just realized, you know, this is, this is what it's about. It's like, you can connect with people no matter how long you've known them, how long you've spent time around them, whether you grew up with them or not. I have brothers and sisters who I've probably seen physically five to seven times oh. in my life, but they are as much a brother or sister than anybody else would be like that i grew up in the same house so mm -hmm. it's just interesting the philippines is beautiful beautiful country i mean people are amazing the food is not my favorite <laughs> Why do you say that? there's like one thing i really love uh, uh in the philippine cuisine and it's not lumpia and it's not pancit which is what people always think americans love most of them do what, but, what are those dishes Pansa is like a noodle dish. Um, okay. Have you ever had it? No. Really? Most people love it. And, and if you put a, lot of, a little bit of calamansi on it, which is like a sweet kind of lime, a smaller mm -hmm. lime, 
put some of that on it. It's even tastier. I would liken it to um, pad thai, but okay. not with peanut sauce, just kind of that kind of noodle, a little bit, but smaller. And vegetables, it's, it's kind of, it's whatever. Uh, lumpia, <laughs> it's, it's dipped in egg and I'm allergic to egg. So it's not the greatest for me. But the thing I do love is called turon. And turon is a, for lack of a better term, a banana lumpia. So it's like right. a crust and this banana and then they caramelize the outside and I cannot go visit my family without having turon at least three times. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, it's just... <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think. You say, uh, what, why, well, what are the main differences in your opinion between the United States culture and like the Philippines culture? Or is there, obviously there's a difference, but like tell me what that is. Um, you know, American culture permeates everywhere. So everybody's in love with American culture. My first couple times going over there, I was younger, I used to wear braids in my hair and everybody was thinking I was Brandy because she was really hot at the time, right? <laughs> um, and they just think we're all celebrities. Hmm. And so they're just very much, they're very, very happy to see us, very nice. The hmm. cult, they are welcoming people in general. But if you're from America, you just kind of are like, to them, you're a celebrity. I think every, to most cultures outside of America in developing countries, they tend to think that we are all living in Hollywood <laughs> and Hollywood is everywhere. So, um, so they treat you like that. It's, it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, but I was more concerned about learning about their culture and they've got a beautiful one. I mean, they have specific dances. We used to, we used to um, perform those dances. There's a couple of famous ones, Tinkling and Sinkil, that we would do, which are like these these bamboo sticks that you like click on the ground, and it's, and they all have a lot of meaning behind it. Um, I was even on Filipino uh, variety television when I was oh, wow. old. Yeah, had to get cue cards because it was live, and they. <laughs> A, um, okay, just say this. And I'm like, how do you say this word? Okay, great, let's do it. <laughs> so just speaking straight up Tagalog off cue cards, it's great. Okay, do you, have you retained any of that uh, language? Yes, um, I didn't become fluent yet, but my brothers and sisters, obviously that's their first language in conjunction with English. But yeah, I mean, there'd be things, I'm trying to remember one. So I was like signing off on the show and the, in the variety show, and I would say, "Wag po kayo nga alis balik ang kilig bikul." Okay, what did you just say? Um, basically, thank you for watching, and um, stay tuned okay. for what's coming next on Kilig Bikul. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Huh? That's really cool. Yeah, you know, I think it was a fun experience for sure. Okay. Um, is that the only language you know, or do you know others? Anaba from Arabishwaya. I know Arabic a little bit. Okay. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, Spanish, uh, but, you yeah. Know, Spanish, okay. Fluent, obviously? No, no, I'm not fluent, no. but I can get around. Okay. My daughter will be fluent, though, but I can get around. And it's funny, I did three years in high school, and um, the you think you're going to forget everything. And I typically, I mean, I, I kind of did until I found myself in Costa Rica. And most people don't realize that Costa Rica is hugely big on tourism, but they, mm -hmm. a lot of people there don't actually speak English. And I love that. I love that they're just not like down with patriarchy and like, let's yeah. just learn English because it's, it's America. Right. I actually love that. So you meet a lot of people who have no English. Yeah. And so I was forced to go through these memory banks and just mm -hmm. try to figure out oh, how, how can I communicate that I'd like to have a, you know, a table for two. <laughs> and this is what I would like to eat. <laughs> right. Um, but some things just came back. It was, it was really, mm -hmm. it's really interesting. I think everybody should really try to 
anytime that they are visiting another country, really try to embrace that culture, take on as much as you can, learn yeah. about it. Because everybody is beautiful. That's why America is beautiful, is because it's a melting pot. Right. Me, uh, me and Megan, we, we were on the track to learn German. Yes. Because we were going to go through like, Prague, uh, Amsterdam, and just countries like that. And so we're like, well, most of the countries in that region speak German or some kind of like version of that. So we're like on Duolingo trying to like teach ourselves German, so. That's really good. My parents were stationed in Germany um, okay. at one point and I remember them. I, there's one phrase we used to say in our house because it was the one thing they would tell us and it was, Er ist der Bahnhof? I think it means where is the train station. <laughs> the train station. That's important. Especially in Europe. So, probably okay. butchering it for sure. But yeah. So of course that all kind of fell through with COVID, but but anyway. Um so going back to your acting, you know, background, I had the chance to go on your website after the I think the trailer went up. And I think oh, yeah. I I texted Asia, I'm like, oh my gosh, she's like, honestly, I don't say this, and I feel bad now, but I didn't do any, like, background research on, on you at all prior to, like, meeting up and, you know, getting started with the project, so when I saw the trailer, when I was scrolling through the website, oh my gosh, she's been a, like, Fox ad for, was it, it was some kind of dance show? So you think you can dance, yeah. So you think, yeah, so I was like, oh my gosh, and then going through your, your headshots and just your acting reel, and I'm like, Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. That yeah. Means a lot. And just to make you feel better, I didn't do any research on you either. Okay, good. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Um, yeah, I, I've been, it, well, I moved to LA when I was a different age than I am now. And I lived there for 14 years. So I've done, uh, I've done some things, you know, mm -hmm. nobody's ever fully satisfied with where they're at but I've done some things um, okay. and I'm grateful for the journey every it's all it's all growth it's all growth right yeah so I, go oh. ahead no you go first no, no I wasn't saying anything. I'm trying to do something about that. you're fine um what have been some of your most memorable experiences while being in LA in terms being of in LA career? yeah in terms of your career who um there's a movie I did. It was actually the first movie. Sorry, my earring is doing something funny. Um, it was the first movie that I did, I think. Yeah, it's the first movie, it was a feature film. And um, the way I got that role was because I was working um, at a restaurant. And don't laugh at the name. I'm kidding. You can totally laugh at it. It was called Pink Taco. So I was nice. working at Pink Taco. Did they have like a like a food emblem logo or some kind of they did but it really was a pink taco so it was a taco and then it had pink onions on it so we made it oh, a pink okay. taco but yeah okay. it, you know it's LA so they were trying to be double entendre dirty there you go. um and so they uh so I was working there and I was uh, a lead hostess and so I recognized my regulars they'd come in and we were right on the sunset strip and so they're you know, the patio was facing the Sunset Strip. It was a place to be seen, kind of. Mm -hmm. And so we would, I, but I recognized my regulars. And I had a regular once who, I didn't know what he did, but I knew he was a regular. He used to come here all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and one time he came in, he's like, I forgot to make a reservation, but do you happen to have the seat? I know him. I'm like, of course, Mr. Culpepper, I've got you. You know, and um, he was like, Culpepper? No, his name is Clint Culpepper. Oh, okay. Yes. And he said, um, you're an actress? And I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Everybody in this town is an actress, right? I, I, don't, I don't trust anybody coming in and going with that line at first. And so, um, but he recognized that and he was like, it's, it's okay. I'm president of Screen Gems. And- uh, Oh, no big deal. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, so he's like, uh, who are you repped by? And I told him my agency and he's like, okay, great. Who's your actual rep? And so then he writes down, I tell him my agent's name. He writes down, he's like, okay, thank you. And then he goes back and he's like, I'm going to bring you in for a meeting. I'm going to reach out to Ooh. you. And I was like, okay. And so then um, 
before my shift had even ended, he, my agents reached out to me and said, Clint Culpepper wants to just do a general with you at Sony. Um, we have you scheduled for tomorrow. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Hold on. Don't <laughs> tell <me>. yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, yep, I, I went. And when we did that meeting, he showed me around to everyone. I remember they were cutting a Chris Brown movie in one room. And then he was just like showing me off to everybody. And he was like, this is Crystal. I want, I, I know we don't have anything right now, but we got to find something. Next thing we have, let's put her in. And it just sounded like, like the Hollywood thing, you know, it just didn't sound mm -hmm. real to me, but everybody was super nice. And he would keep coming to the restaurant. And one day he was like, okay, so we found a project. It's not a big role. Think I can get you in though. Are you interested? And I said, absolutely. He's like, yeah, it's just, you know, this dog walker. Um, but it's, it should be a fun movie. Uh, turns out that that movie was about last night with Kevin Hart, Michael Ealy, Joy Bryant, Regina Hall. So it was pretty good movie. I don't think I've seen yeah. it, but I've heard of it. Yeah, so um, it brought me on to do one role. But it, it, the thing is, no audition. It was just like, let's put Crystal in it. And there was so, not like, I have to say this because it, it bears being said. I've been in the industry in a long time. I've dealt with a lot of different types of people, a lot of praying types of people mm -hmm. without being too descriptive. But there's, that is an underbelly of Hollywood for sure. And I've seen it, I've dealt with it. This, this was not that. It was literally just, I see you as an, a, an artist and mm -hmm. I want to help you out. Give you, give you a, an opportunity. And yeah. it, that's all it was. And it was, so that's one of a very memorable moment for me. The other memorable one is working on that film because I was green. <laughs> <laughs> okay, was this I like your first big like, Hollywood experience or had you had a couple prior to that. My first movie. Okay. Yeah, it's my first movie. I've done a couple TV shows. But I was surrounded by like just people that I just, I don't know. I was starting to go to Michelle. Like, I can't believe it. I've been acting. I've been doing my classes. And then it's a different thing when you get on set. And I remember director Steve Pink. Um, they, everybody was kind of like just okay, they're, they're, I could tell they weren't getting what they wanted out of me. And it made me so uncomfortable and I don't know what I'm supposed to do, right? Um, my scene was with Michael Ealy. And so I remember them going to do something with the camera and they're like, well, we'll, we'll come back to it. Basically, let's take a, take a five, pretty much. And uh, Michael pulled me aside and he said, okay, let's just run the lines together. Michael Ealy, big guy, you know, he's, he's a good, like, He's a recognizable actor. Mm -hmm. He pulls me aside and just tells me, let's run lines. And we do, but he, he's like, he's standing up on the stair and he's like here and I'm here and we're talking and we're going through the scene. And he was like, do you see that connection, that closeness that we feel? I know they have these marks super far away. That guy, but okay. We need to keep... Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry, I had to look him up. <laughs> it's okay. And so he's like, just keep that closeness even though we're not actually that close and even though we've worked on that in acting class and we've talked about it it was a different thing being on it because it's very like I you know this is 10 years ago but I was far away from him so it was like do I need to yell do I need to you know it was just a a learning experience but him taking me aside and just working on it with me and being like you're great let's just keep this and he didn't have to do that. He could have gone to his trailer for those five minutes. He could have right. went and talked to stars, but he was just like, no, I'm going to help her out. And I have always appreciated that moment because that's the kind of actor I strive to be. It's always, it's a collaboration. So let's all work mm -hmm. together to make it. That's really awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, just for, just for like, I guess, professional, uh, like contact did you ever get his like phone number for like hey if you're on a, like a project or a film or show and you know like the producer or whoever no no okay no <laughs> no i just uh did my did my my work that day and then kept it pushing okay yeah was the did that give you did that push you in a sag or were you eligible or how did what was the status for you oh i got sag from extra work Okay. So when I first moved to LA, I was in college and then I failed all my classes because I was on set every day. So um, 
there was a call from central casting that said they needed ethnic cheerleaders. I had cheerleading on my resume. So it's always good, you know, to put your, right. your skills as varied as they are on your resume. You never know who's going to be looking at that. So there was an audition. Come in. We need to see some ethnic cheerleaders because the show was in CIS and they were, put, they, the team that they had, they pulled from a place called Saugus, which is very much um, one race. Okay, so place. Can I pause you for a second? <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. there, there's just some lag going on. Go ahead. Okay. Can you, yeah, okay. Continue. It's just the video was lagging out. Oh, okay. Sorry. So oh. the, do you want me to cut those wine sips out or are you good with that? I'm okay if you're not tripping. No, out. I'm good. No, I'm not tripping. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. So yeah, so the show was um, in CIS and they needed some ethnic cheerleaders because the team that they had hired to do all the stunts was from a place called Saugus. And Saugus um, is predominantly white. But the show was, I believe, set in DC, the first season, or the first okay. series, the main season mm -hmm. series. And so it just, that wouldn't make sense. So they needed to bring some of us in. Brought us in, we auditioned, then I got picked, and all of us was an extra, it's a special ability extra. But I worked for five days on NCIS for this episode and um, got my SAG eligibility then. That was in 2006 when I first moved to LA and um, I still get residuals for that episode. Nice. Yeah. Are you, <laughs> are you allowed to disclose how much that is? Oh, residuals, they, they range. Okay. I've got the famous one cent check. I actually did, I mean, like I put it on my, on, on a uh, one cent check. cork board. Yeah, one cent check. But yeah, I mean, the $3, $5, $6, but you never know until you read your end of the year statement and you're like, oh, that's how much all of that added up to? So yeah, okay, it's interesting. interesting. Residuals are great. I bet. Um, what else, what else? Um, lost for words here. Tell me about that poster behind you. Yes, so Trace, um, that's my baby. Yeah? I actually have two babies. One's right there, it's kind of hard blown out, there we go. That's my first, that's my second. Um, so, did you get a chance to watch it? Trace, I saw the trailer. Okay, saw the trailer. Um, I'll have to send you the pilot. Um, but I think I am in the, I'm gonna talk to Asia. She's gonna help me, hopefully, uh, once I get everything together, maybe pitch it to Create TV. Yeah, man. So, uh, but anyway, to talk more about that, um, I had this idea of Trace probably for like three years, maybe for, well, more than that now. Uh, and it started out like a simple like two minute short film and then it just kept evolving and draft after draft after draft. And then one day, I think I just was like, all right, I think of had it in my mind long enough when we just put it on paper and then okay. and then I was like you know what I think at the beginning of last year I was like fuck it let me just put on a casting call and just get the ball rolling and so uh, I think we started production in May no it was July sorry um so from January to like maybe the last or couple weeks into June was like pre-production and then we just moved right into um, oh, filming like three weeks later um, and like I knew it was going to cost money but like it cost more money than I thought it would have just like you started with your budget of 10g and they're like oh next thing you know we're like double that budget overnight so it was yeah. kind of like that thing, uh, whole experience. It's like, damn, but like it was so worth, you know, spending every single dollar on it. So that's what it comes down to. It's like, is this going to make the series, like the, make the show what it needs to be, or is this just being extravagant? And sometimes, right. you know, you got to make that call. Mm -hmm. So did you write it? You were the writer of it. Yes. Um, I initially had one guy, uh, his name's Tim, and he kind of just gave me some like ideas, but he, 
that was kind of the the gist of his uh support on it so mainly just me writing it so i love that that's my first thing people ask me for advice on writing all the time and i'm like i mean i'm self-taught so mm -hmm. first rule is sit down and write get it out of your head formatting can always be learned later on but get the story out while it's fresh you know right. just sit down apply as to chair that is the yep. first rule of true. writing <laughs> true so but yeah it was uh like i said it's definitely experience i had obviously probably like i mean i had fun during the whole process but writing it was the most fun because you get to i mean once you get the story down then it's like all right let me format it get the character type what's his motivation what's her motivation and you know what's their background what's their overall objective um and then you know having a conflict a conflicting uh, character and then selecting a specific kind of character like you have your anti-heroes heroes um sounds like oreos um heroes <laughs> and just different kind of characters like that and just really exploring like who that character is and have that be a reflection of who actually you are as a person so yeah it's, it's fascinating it's 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 so freeing um because i'm i started off as an actor and then when i decided to start writing it was freeing. It was like nobody I, with acting, you have to kind of wait for somebody to give you a job. Mm -hmm. uh, you can practice, you can play with your friends and stuff. And now that's becoming way more prevalent to where you can actually really play with your friends. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, growing up and co coming up before this digital transformation, yeah, I mean, no, you had to wait for somebody to say yes. But with writing, you didn't have to do that. So I always say I've seen so many great movies and TV shows that nobody else has ever seen because my library is super extensive at this point. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's the greatest thing is that no permission needed. That's good. It's very liberating. Yeah. What, what do you, when it comes to formatting, is there a certain style you go by or is there you created your own? No, absolutely. I go by Hollywood standard. Um, I write my scripts in final draft. Um, I keep up to date on the versions and um, the it's final draft like formats it for you. So okay. man alive, I think I tried once with Word doc and I Ooh. tried based on what I know this, what I learned it was and it was like, and I was like, and five spaces in and no. That sounds. No. Oh, tedious. Yeah, that wasn't gonna work. So I was working off Celtics for a while, but Celtics is just so, it's like, it's annoyed that it's not as popular as Final Draft. So it just decided to like be extra and be different. So all the short short keys, the hot keys would be like reversed. Just, oh, just, really? just because, just because. Interesting. Pay attention to me. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I stopped you. And, and Celtics used to be free, and now there's like they're subscri subscription based. Um, it's just worth it for me. Just all I have to do, I think, when I write my scripts, the most I do is press enter and shift, and just, just keep writing. Nice. So yeah, it does it for you. Um, in terms of the way I write, that is unique to me. Uh, I'm kind of a writer director, and I didn't realize that at first until I had a couple of people read my stuff and they said, you know, you really should direct this. It's very clear you know what you want. You can see it very clearly in your head. And the way you write paints the picture. It's not just like, hey, whoever's gonna direct this, fill in your vision. It's very much like, she's telling you exactly what she wants to see. <laughs> okay. So like, let me see her. And I was like, it took a long time, about six years before I was like, really? Think so? But yeah. Hmm. Like, Interesting. Always evolving. You learn so much about yourself, the more you just keep delving into your art. Sure. I mean, I'm sure you would agree. Yes. Um, and it's interesting because Like for me, you do your first project, whoever that, whatever that may be. And like it could, it's, you know, I guess on average, it's 
you know, garbage, like your first project is going to be like a total, you know, wash. You may get it done, but like, oh, it's, I don't want to put my name on that. But I think mm -hmm. as you go, you progress. And so it's almost like you do like your first feature film. It's like, all right, I got my bachelor's degree. And then you do, yeah. you know, you just keep going. And then next thing you're like, oh, I got my PhD because you just learned so much. And I'm like, oh, we're not going to do that again. Oh yeah, yeah, that that worked really well. Let's just emulate that, and uh, and just you know even make that better. So, yep. One thing I will tell anybody who is trying to make their own film, I don't care what camera you use, I don't care how great or bad the script is, I really don't even care what your lighting looks like, as long as you can make sure we can hear, because yes. sound. I believe is the most important and vital aspect. And that was my first lesson because I did my first directorial um, thing. I have a poster, let me grab it. Yeah, let me see. Uh, this is my first Ooh. directorial thing. Uh, I like it. Yes. So this was a fan film, scandal fan film. Okay, so, it's got that vibe. Oh, that's me. That's wait, another wait, one. that's you? I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. And then um, this was based off Scandal. So this was okay. obviously Fitzgerald Grant and this was um, Olivia Pope. Okay. And the like scene, it. everything was great. Even the camera, we were working on a, with a red camera, which was hot back in the day, you know, red. Everybody had oh, red. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but it was, honestly, it was a very, very good well-written, music mixed, color graded. It was nice. It was really good. It felt very real to the characters. You couldn't hear us very well. And the oh. sound was shit. The sound was terrible. Um, and there was no way of fixing it. I remember us trying to adjust the levels when we were sitting in the edits. Was it, it was just, just mixed too low? No, the, the boom up was pretty much like, oh, here's the little mic I have. Pretty much yeah. like, how you guys doing? Are you guys like? Can you hear me? <laughs> oh like, my gosh, that's <laughs> unfortunate. Yeah, so that that is the advice I would give to anybody. We we will sit through almost any garbage, but if we can't hear it, there's no point of us sitting there. True. True. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I'm really. Uh, I'm I'm really impressed by Sam's work. Uh, yeah. Coming in and being able to just like what, what really blows my mind is like the whole process for new Jim Crow. Cause I never done it where like I do my portion and then I pass off the drive and then it goes mm -hmm. to someone else. And then, you know, in parallel, Sam is doing his work on the audio and then it comes back and I've never had to do that. And um, I'm impressed by both Sam and Ian for being able to, for the most part, come together and bring everything back that needs to be in its place and then just continue on and then not have to worry about anything else, so. Yeah, uh, our COVID-19 way of having to edit this project was a challenge, but not impossible as we've seen. I mean, I'm so happy with what we did. Yeah. So happy, beyond. I remember sitting with you that first day when I was interviewing. For, like, you, I met you right before I met Asia. That's oh, really? The like the same day or the next day? Yeah, because I came there to do my interviews uh -huh. You and I met because I had already hired you, but then, um, which is like, hey, let's say hi. And then the next person was Asia. She was the first okay. interview of the day. So it's just, it's funny how it all worked out. And Spencer, mm -hmm. I met in that same interview day. And I believe there was one girl who was on it, but she didn't, she didn't stay with us the entire time. So those are the only two, the only three people from that, from those interviews was you, Asia and uh, Spencer. But yeah, so it was just, um, everybody just really pulled their weight and I just didn't even, I, I just, I told you when we sat there, sat down, I said, can we make it cinematic though? That's what I want. Like, can it be cinematic? And it was like, we could do it. And we could cost a little bit more, but we could do it. And we yeah. did. So I'm proud of us. Same, same. Yeah. Um, I had a question and... Uh, huh? So I want you to just stop, don't move your head, and then just glance behind you slightly with your eyes. Just look 
look at the poster of Trace. Some part of that right now is giving me Chucky vibes. Is it <laughs> Do really? You know Chucky? Yeah. Yes. Because I can't see all of it. Like, so just something about that. When you kind of cover up her necklace, it, it's giving me Chucky vibes. I wonder if anybody else is going to see this. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. If you uh, do see, leave a comment or send an email. Yes. <laughs> um, interesting. I've never thought of that. Huh. I think it's the coloring. The same colors that's in that Chucky thing. Chucky, yeah. I, I was also super afraid of. So. Oh my gosh. Oh. Yeah, that image is just burned. Him along with the ring girl, Samara. Oh yeah. There's a, I don't know, I haven't seen in a while, but there's like a gang in like Atlanta. I don't, it's not violent, but they just roam around in like Dodge Char Challengers and they have like a bunch of like Chucky dolls strapped to the roofs and they just drive around and play loud music. And no. <laughs> no. I got kicked out of Halloween Horror Nights once because um, the guy I was seeing at the time got afraid because a uh, performer, because you know Halloween Horror Nights, big maze thing, and it's mm -hmm. on Halloween, and it's all you know Universal movies. So you have, you have a. I remember Freddy Krueger, and that's the one I like fell to the ground. I'm <laughs> sure they use promos from now on. But um, yeah, Chucky came running out of a dark corner, and <laughs> oh, hell no. <laughs> first I was literally turned around and it, he just clocked him so re oh, wow. reflex but so. <laughs> that was no hilarious yeah no clocked him and we got in trouble because you're not supposed to touch the actors well of course but if you yeah. come at me exactly it's a different story i used to work <laughs> in a haunted house and i would i would hear horror stories like that all the time freddy krueger will always scare me and then shock value and all that stuff. Although, have you seen The Ring since you've been an adult? I think I've seen like the first one. And I was, when it came out, um, I was in high school, I think, early high school. And I, yeah. I, I don't do scary movies. I'm a big chicken. Like, okay. I've, I think I've come out of that a little bit. I saw like a and they're not really scary. They're just kind of like shock value scary. Uh, yeah. It was as above, so below. Hmm. But it's, it's, um, it's like a found footage film about these, you know, these over eccentric teenagers going into the catacombs of Paris. And then oh. they, keep, they keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. And they just find more and like weird shit happening and like very like demonic and just I don't know I, I can't describe it, just weird shit starts happening to them and then at the end spoiler they come out on the other side it's just like a uh, guy and a girl left I think like six go in and two come out wow yeah it's really interesting so yeah I don't like them either but uh and I don't really watch them anymore but growing up I I thought I could handle that well I watched the ring it nightmares it took me a while to get over that one that was that was my um what's the one where the exorcist so all, like my mom's generation and was all afraid of the exorcist i was a like I'm, a lot of people in my generation were afraid of the ring yeah. so i rewatched the ring probably about four years ago mm -hmm. and i was like this is not scary anymore yeah. Because we've been so far past that. Mm -hmm. So far past that. But that's just, that's how we move, man. This, yeah. this, in the 10, 15 years that I've been doing this business, so much has changed. Mm -hmm. Netflix used to send out DVDs. Yeah, I remember that's that. That's all that they were about. There's, yeah, I, I think... Uh... I think I was at my parents' place. I found my old Blockbuster card. Yeah, see? Oh, like, man, I, I love going to the video store. Yes. Getting all the snacks. And see, sometimes when we just move everything online, we miss a lot of those experiences. Nostalgia of going and, like, picking out the newest release and, like, yep. pulling it out of the VHS sleeve and putting it in. Or even yep. DVD at that point, yeah. 
crazy times. Mm -hmm. RIP Blockbuster. RIP. True. <laughs> there, I, um, good. No, I was gonna say there's a. Um, it's not Blockbuster, but they kept this. I think the small company bought the building, and they kept like the sign up front. So it's what like. Was it? It's, like, it's a, it's a Blockbuster like store. It's in like oh. Washington. Yeah. Um, they just bought the building and everything, like the sign was still up. And since the company is bankrupt and no longer exists, I think they were allowed to use it. And so, wow. and they're like the only VHS and DVD store in the town or something like that. I remember there, there, there was another one, a competitor. Was it called Hollywood video? Yeah. Was it Hollywood video? Yep. It was yeah. like a green and orange logo. Yeah. Yeah. I was just like, man, it was just like fun. You could go with my, my mom would just take me and my sisters and we would just, you guys want to get a movie tonight? And the closest thing we have to that now is Redbox, but it's still so isolated, you know? Mm -hmm. There's a great movie I love called The Holiday. And it has Jack Black, Kate Winslet, um, Jude Law, and Cameron Diaz in it. And there's a scene where they're, where Jack Black and Kate Winslet are in a blockbuster. And then they just, they run, they're trying to find a movie and Jack Black's character, he's a composer. So he's going through and he's like, just starting to sing the, the, the scores from different movies. Mm -hmm. So he's like, he pulls up Jaws and he's like, Donna, Donna, <laughs> two notes, totally bro, <laughs> you know, and then. <laughs> He goes, finds another one. Where did you go, Joe DiMaggio? I could watch this movie several times. <laughs> and he's like, Clearly. Right. And then it's, um, he's holding a graduate. And then they have this cameo of Dustin Hoffman actually in the same video store, just like. <laughs> oh, really? That's funny. <laughs> it was great. But that movie doesn't even feel like that old. But that store doesn't exist. That experience no right. longer exists. Now, Finding a movie consists of the 15, 20 minutes you, you do searching on, on Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, right? what, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. interesting. I miss the nostalgia of it, but, you know, times change. I'm just curious to see what happens with, like, cable network television. That's the, that's you know? the next thing on its way out. Um, they're going to have to evolve yeah but they have you know they're trying to do their networks and stuff what i think is going to happen is because netflix started this whole thing and now everybody needs to get a streaming platform and it's been going for the last five five seven years um it's going to become too much and then they're going to look for ways to consolidate again which is just going to take us back to where we were you have your abc your NBC, your Fox. It's just going to, that's what's going to happen because there's Disney Plus, there's, there's actually too many to, to mention. There's too many to list. Mm -hmm. And then you start adding up the cost of subscriptions to all these things. The only right. thing that can happen is mergers. And when those mergers happen, you're going to have a new network studio system. It's just going to be comprised of all these other Streaming, is it going to be streaming? Yeah. That's what I think is going to happen. Hmm. Yeah, I have no idea. That'd be interesting to see what happens. I know Disney. Doesn't, I mean, I think, doesn't Disney own a lot of these companies already? I think, um, I think you know who owns most probably, and I, this is just not based on any research at all. But it's probably Amazon. I feel like Amazon owns everything. <laughs> Amazon owns everything and Google. Okay. I thought Disney had their hand in a lot. Um, they do, but their their streaming platform is, I love it because it's Disney, you know, they unlock the vault. But uh, they don't, they, they're not as competitive. They can't be because they do require studio budgets to make their projects. Um, whereas, you know, Netflix and Hulu and stuff, they can make original projects for not those huge budgets. Yeah. So they can, and they're able to churn out more work, uh, more content on a consistent basis where Disney may be able to do one, maybe two 
that pretty much one a year. You yeah. can't you can't keep a network just putting out one new thing every year. True. Um, I want to get back to your uh, your acting experience. Um, is there anything you else do want to mention? I know we're kind of we're all over the place as a conversation, but uh, yeah, is there anything else uh, that you would want to mention about your acting career? I don't know. Is there anything else you want to know? I am not great at talking purely about myself. Okay. Um, I mean, there is, but I want to keep that in regard. What? I guess, I guess one more question I have is uh, what's your, like, your end goal? Like, I, I assume you're SAG, but like, what, what's the next step for you? Well, you know, same thing we try to do every day, Pinky. Take over the world. We should have did this <laughs> podcast tomorrow <laughs> to make it perfect. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so the end goal is, I'm, I'm kind of living it. I want to continue to tell stories. Um, and I'm a storyteller. So when people ask me what I do, I'm a storyteller. Sometimes they tell stories through written word. Sometimes they tell it through song. Yeah, I mean, I do it for myself. You'll never hear my music. I'm not gonna right. say that. Never, never say never, but it's, it's a personal thing for me. Okay. Um, through dance and through uh, my acting work. So it's, I'm all, always going to be telling stories. Mm -hmm. What do I hope my stories do? I hope that makes people think. Um, I don't want to like out myself, but what I'm trying to do with most of my stories, besides connecting people and um, making people feel seen and heard, is I'm trying to deliver messages in the guise of entertainment. Okay. That is why I make movies that matter. So I can't always control that with that, my acting career but I can control it with what I'm writing. True, okay. Yeah, so one day just be one of the, one of the forces, that's what I'm hoping, one of the forces of uh, elevated storytelling, that's what I hope. Okay, good. I can tell you, um, yes. I moved to Atlanta actually just it's in, in September, so I haven't even been here for a year. Uh, the goal was to come over here to just start creating on my own. I know here is a little, people in LA love to create and get together and do that as well. It's just that sometimes it's a little bit harder to do it. Um, over here, I feel that there's a lot of people who are super talented, who just want to um, create. And they're not so much worried about um, ego. Let's just branch it under ego. And I think you'll find a lot more of that in LA. So when I came over here, I was like, you know, I know that there's things I want to do and I want to find a good team and I want to just keep creating and mm -hmm. I want to take care of my crew. That was hugely important to me when it came down to pay structure and stuff. Didn't have a big budget, but crew was right. important. And so that's what I did what I could. And now we have like a production company. Like we're really, I mean, we all have our, our own, but we are like, we're getting together, we're doing more stuff. And that's, right. yeah, you guys are just amazing artists. Like I love working with you. I love working with Asia. I was very sad on day three when we were done right. shooting. I was like, hey, I'm not gonna see you guys tomorrow. And it's just... It's only Wednesday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I got to go back to work on Thursday because, yeah, I do a full-time job as well. Um, so, yeah, I think that the Atlanta scene versus the L.A. scene, I would venture to say that there are, especially with COVID, um, we're in a special place right now that we can really take this to another level. Mm -hmm. Like... If we're, if we're focused on making quality content, 
it's it's a, a new frontier you know what, what is mm -hmm. that called? yeah i think a new frontier it's like the wild wild west right now anybody who can succeed in navigating filming in a situation like this we have something like 18 months where it's going to be touch and go how do we do these things yeah you already discovered well guess what you can edit and not have to sit in the edit editing bay with somebody right we're discovering you can direct people and you don't have to be in the same room with them and i'll just say that as a little tidbit on what we're working on next but um yes it's the people who can adapt quickly and recognize what's happening and recognize um and understand business business of hollywood they're going to be the ones who come out on top yeah. so if anybody is listening and you're inspired and you want to make something there's a problem find a solution yeah. if you can do that you get to be the next voice of film filmmakers sure and it's yeah. crazy that we we already have all the tools that we would need to do it virtually and i'm just thinking about how you just mentioned directing actors and actresses without being mm -hmm. in the same room and yeah just thinking of the possibilities how how that can be done um pretty god you have really good internet but <laughs> <laughs> right right but yeah interesting so um have you heard what tyler perry is going to be start doing in his projects i I did, and it's kind of in line with some of the stuff I heard um, when I auditioned for a commercial recently. And my ring got must have got stepped on. I'm so sad. Um, so the guidelines for filming in person is going to be different. Mm -hmm. um, figuring out the solutions for that right now is just a lot of safety focus, which that's what it needs to be. Yeah. If something like this were to continue on for a very long time, you can't film scenes where people are in close contact. You can't film crowd scenes, right? That's going to be the next thing that people are going to have to figure out a way around. Um, like you said, we have all the tools. It's there. It's just more work, but it's there. And, and so what he's going to be doing and these people separate and stuff, what my fear about the way the industry is heading is that um, the the feeling of being on set is going to change. Mm -hmm. The camaraderie with your castmates is going to change. And just think about it as how, how we think about um, hanging out with people now. Mm -hmm. And before COVID, before COVID, how we hang out with people now is different. Sure. We hang out through IG, through Facebook, through FaceTime, through, you know, and right. you'll have the occasion, you'll have the meetups and stuff, but it's different. And so that's kind of what the film industry is going to experience is a little bit of a difference in how you can relate with your castmates. And that's, that's, that's going to be a little sad because artists love other artists and we love to connect. And you may see a decline in the performances coming out of that because you're not able to connect. Right. So that's another problem that you got to find a solution to. But I do foresee that it's going to be a little bit of a depressing time being on set, being an actor. Okay. Yeah. In case you guys were, you know, wondering what I think about <laughs> the future of Hollywood. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Well, Crystal, I hate to do it short, but uh, me and Megan scheduled our podcast on the same night. Oh, so, okay. yes. So she has a podcast. Yeah, it's Crime and Roses. She, um, I don't know if you see the name of the participants. I did see it. I thought this was called, and I was like, that's not what yours is. Yours is yeah. Like, yeah. So she has a Zoom, and so we just kind of co share that. And, um, so she does, it's her and her friend Danielle, co-worker Danielle, and they do a Bachelor Nation like coverage. Oh, I love then, that. As well as True Crime Podcast. And so they've been covering Listen to Your Heart for like the last, I don't know how many weeks. And they just had the season finale on Monday. 
That's so awesome. I awesome. want to send me the link. I want to support. Yes. Um, yes. And I'm grateful that you are, uh, that you had me on, but also I got to go cook dinner for, you know, a tiny person downstairs. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to thank you for coming on. Um, I know we kind of had figuring out some times, but yeah, it's been, it's been a pleasure and thank you for again coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And I hope you guys had a good time listening. Yes. All right, y'all. I will look forward to seeing you next week. Take and care. Don't forget to subscribe. Oh, yes. Like, click, share, subscribe, tweet, retweet, like, follow, all of the necessary social media things. All of the stuff. Thanks, Crystal. <laughs> Bye. Bye.